Hello, my name is Bradley Elisea. I'm the head scientist at the Orthogonal Research and Education Lab. And the title of this talk is Allostasis Machines, a model for understanding internal states and technological environments. I'm presenting on behalf of my co-authors, uh, Daniela C. Alfi, Anson Z. Lim, and Jesse Parent. And at the bottom left, you can see all of our Twitter handles. So this presentation is based on a fairly large question. Um, and that is, why do we propose a coupling between the embodied brain and technological environment? So a term in our workshop paper we call NeuroHCI can be characterized as an allostasis machine. And so there's three reasons for this. The first is, is that it's a way to understand the communication channels between the brain, body, and environment. So an example, of this is how tools augment performance. The second reason is, is that it's a way to understand the role of capacity and noise tolerance on task performance in naturalistic settings. And by capacity, we mean information channel capacity. And by noise tolerance, that means that the information channel is tolerant to noise. And so the third reason then is a way to, that this is a way to summarize dynamic regulation as well as self-regulation in a set of interactions. And there are three concepts that we name in the paper, and we will go through in a minute, autopoiesis, homeostasis, and allostasis. All these three things are related and they play into this idea of an allostasis machine. So the first of these is homeostasis. And homeostasis was defined by Norbert Wiener as a collective of objects or things in a system that are held together in action. It's a statement about the stability of a system. Uh, Claude Bernard, who worked on uh, animal physiology, referred to it as regulation of the internal milieu. And milieu is a French word meaning environment. And so internal meaning within the body. So this is an example of a homeostatic system. There's a balance between a stimulus, which kind of pushes the system towards maybe a new state and introduces a perturbation or a noise. There's a receptor that takes in the stimulus. There's a control center that modulates the stimulus, produces some sort of behavior which goes through an effector and affects the homeostasis. So there's a push between environmental perturbation and internal regulation of that perturbation. And these things have to be in balance in order for homeostasis to work. There are also four things that we can say about homeostasis that are more general. Uh, one is that it includes mechanisms that regulate constancy in an open system. So it regulates sort of a, a status quo or a, a balance in the system. Uh, two is that there's a tendency towards change, of course, but it also meets factors that resist change. So it's almost like if you know anything about tensegrity in a, a structural, um, you know, something, uh, some sort of structure where they're opposing forces that sort of are held in tension and it, it, makes, it makes for stability. Uh, three is that they're cooperating mechanisms that act simultaneously or successively. We know this because we know that this black box that sort of regulates everything ha has to have some sort of set of cooperating mechanisms. If it didn't, we wouldn't be able to have this constancy over time. And four is that homeostasis is an act of self-organization. And so, again, these things are, have to be self-organized. They can't be managed uh, in a top-down fashion. They have to respond to the environment dynamically. Uh, this allows us to think in terms of circularity and nonlinear effects as well. This allows us to think uh, beyond sort of linear causality and allows us to understand how things might accumulate over time or they might act collectively. And so this, this gives us a new view on the systems that regulate our internal state. But homeostasis is an equilibrium model. That's the drawback of using homeostasis. So what happens when the brain, body, and environment are far from equilibrium? And many naturalistic behaviors, for example, they're very far from equilibrium. So that's where we bring in allostasis. And allostasis, of course, is this idea. It's, it's based on homeostasis, but it allows for multiple states to be modeled in the same system. This is consistent with a dynamical systems approach, as you can see from the figure below. You have 
allostasis, which is driving things away from the homeostatic set point. So, you know, it's like a, a thermometer where you have, uh, you set it at a constant temperature, the temperature fluctuates, and whatever mechanism is controlling the, keeping the temperature constant is triggered. And it's a sort of a, a you know, there's a challenge from the environment and then there's a corresponding response. So that's what you see here. There's homeostatic recovery and there's allostasis or allostatic drive. And so you have this set point that the system is maintained around, but then you also have something called allostatic load. And so the allostatic load is where there's change in one direction, some environmental challenge that's so great that the homeostatic recovery can't catch up. And so this is what we call allostatic drive, where it derives it to a new or altered set point. So it allows for multiple set points. It allows critically for that process between two different set points and how the system moves from one set point to another. So this is an integrator of environment and innate mechanisms. Uh, it also allows for a regulatory mechanism for changing between states. Um, and so uh, what is needed here to understand the embodied brain as an allostasis machine is an event-oriented trajectory of internal state to represent dynamic output. So you can see these figures here. You can see that you have different patterns, say, of stimulus or environmental challenge. You have repeated hits. You have prolonged response. You have lack of adaptation by the internal model, and you have an adequate response by the internal model. And so you can see all these. Um, we make the statement here that the embodied brain is an allostasis machine that differentiates between states, allows for adaptation, and captures the effects of prolonged response to an environment. So you can see all these examples here. So it's a very flexible model. And this, of course, allostasis and allostatic drive leads us to the allostasis machine. So, you know, one of our main goals here is to understand temporal regulation and cumulative effects at multiple states scales of time. And so uh, we have a couple statements here. The first is that noise is inherent in coupled cognition. So we saw that time series, and of course a time series can include noise. And of course allostatic drive is also driven by noise. Um, tools and tasks that are compatible with the brain's bodily representation are less noisy, more dynamically stable. This is an observation we make in the paper. And again, this so there are a lot of things that modify or, or modulate uh, allostatic drive and modulate what state you're in, and modulate even like you know maybe there you know there's a rule for staying in the same state over time. So we you know consider the tools and tasks that are compatible with this bodily representation. Um, if there are affordances available to the individual, then this will affect the outcome of this dynamical system. Uh, additionally, small and frequent fluctuations are omnipresent in interaction. So if I'm interacting with any technological system, there are always these small and frequent fluctuations that sort of occur, uh, but you can overcome those very easily. However, large or frequent fluctuations can disrupt the system. So what do we mean by that? Well, in this diagram, we can see that when you have perturbations from the environment, they could be distractions while you're driving. They could be, you know, um, different sorts of uh, noise when you're writing something on a piece of paper. Uh, those are all perturbations. And these perturbations can be delivered in a number of patterns over time. So you can see here, these red tick marks, they show uh, how the internal model inside the body can be affected by these different patterns of perturbation. So these perturbations can lead to sort of a deformation or a lack of recovery in the internal model's function. We'll see examples of this in a little bit. Uh, mass perturbation, which are these clustered tick marks in different locations along this line, are more likely to trigger allostatic drive events and this sort of uh, lack of recovery. So what do I mean by lack of recovery in all this sort of language? So enter our allostasis machine output. And this is sort of the core of the idea. Aside from having an internal model, which we'll talk about in a minute, these are the output diagrams. And these are really this, the essence of what an allostasis machine involves. So at the upper right, we have this example of someone in a virtual environment set up. They're in a, 
in a cave environment where they're getting perturbations while they're walking on this treadmill. And they have this baseline and then they're exposed to perturbations and then they're tested. So they walk on this treadmill and they either experience perturbations or they don't. And they test them at the baseline and then post to see if what their um, response is like. And so this, tr this sort of behavioral paradigm can be measured using an allostasis machine. This is a dynamical output of what's going on in their internal model or their brain as this process of perturbation or no perturbation while they're walking is going on. So there's an initial condition, then there are perturbations that are delivered over time, and these perturbations drive this initial uh, line further down from the initial condition. And this line can either recover to its original elevation in this diagram, or it can be permanently deformed and lead us in, in terms of recovering the system after the perturbations are complete to some sort of different regulated state. And so this arrow of time shows the connection between the initial condition and the regulated state. So you can see a breakout here of how one of these perturbations works. There's a baseline measurement. There's a magnitude of the perturbation, which is this uh, phase angle here. There's a recovery, which is this opposite phase angle. And when the perturbation leads to a recovery that's not equivalent to the magnitude, we refer to that as uh, hysteresis. And so that's what drives this differential recovered state. It can be the same as the baseline, but it's usually, and, and in this case it is, it can be modified. So this recovered state then is different from the baseline state, and it leads to this response that's hysteretic or this response that hasn't sort of isn't homeostatic and in fact is uh, experienced allostatic drive. You see allostasis machines perhaps responsible for behaviors in other systems besides human cognition. So I gave you an example from human cognition and I'm going very broadly here. You have allostasis operating in plants, in plant growth uh, with respect to stress perturbations and other types of uh, events that happen during the growth of a plant. So you have this sort of, uh, you have this internal model of plant growth and also epigenetic memory that kick into to play here and result in differential growth in plants that experience different types of stresses. You also have this in phenotypic development in this case, you have the Drosophila wing, where you have all of this very this internal variation, variation in the environment and noise, and it goes into this developmental black box, and it produces changes in the development of this phenotype, so changes in the shape of the wing. And so all of these can be characterized using this type of allostasis machine approach. And so now we get into this internal model. So the internal model is a black box. It could apply to human cognition. It could apply to a number of other systems. It involves these uh, innate uh, mechanisms such as uh, uh, gene expression, or it could involve sensory processing in the brain. It could involve other physiological systems as well. So it's a very flexible system, which can be defined by context. And then, so one example of what happens in an internal model during this sort of perturbation uh, cycle is internal dysregulation. So this is a very early version of a biocybernetic bio cycle from von Uxkull. And this shows kind of what the internal world looks like. You have a sense net and effect net, an object in the environment. And so you have this feedback loop and this feedback loop is uh, disrupted and it has consequences for adaptive behavior. So during internal dysregulation, this uh, simple feedback loop is disrupted in some way. The internal models can be computational. They can be something like sensory motor coordination, or they can be represent representational. They can be mental or attentional. Again, this is just in the brain and you can apply them further out. Um, so you know, this brings us back to the every good regulator theorem. So internal dysregulation involves regulation and Ashby, Conan and Ashby said that every good regulator of a system must be a model of that system. So what happens in the internal model is you build a model of the world and then that model is, you know, either confirmed or not confirmed by the environment. And when it's not confirmed, then you have this internal dysregulation. 
Uh, you also have internal models for coordination, which is for, uh, you know, has these sorts of models have been developed for motor control and for robotics. And this is an example. So it can be actually quite complex and have a lot of intricate feedback loops and other kinds of structure, but it still operates in the same way. You introduce a perturbation, the system is either, you know, absorbs a perturbation or it gets dysregulated by it. And it, the output of the behavioral output is modified accordingly. Uh, finally, you can have things like the cutaneous rabbit illusion. So in this case, you have an internal model of what you think is a rabbit bouncing around in the grass. And what you can do is you can hold out your arm and close your eyes and you can deliver taps to someone's forearm. And if their eyes are closed, they won't necessarily know what it is. So people have done this illusion and they've reported that rabbits are running up their arm. And so what happens is, is that those sensations are delivered to the arm, but there's no way to verify the internal model. So the internal model is interpreting it as something, some range of things. And one of those things is rabbit hopping. So, you know, you're trying to sort of, it's, it's sort of something that's reconstructed from maybe previous visual experience. Um, phantom sensations can fill in the gaps and give you this percept. And so, you know, the internal model can do a lot of things that are really kind of uh, interesting during this regulation. So this leads to a lot of new, new cognitive states. Uh, one of the things that we've been experimenting with here is using a regulatory model, the evolution of cybernetic states. So this internal model is quite complex and it involves a number of feedbacks and loops. And so this is an example of a cybernetic uh, state machine where we have these, you know, we add in different boxes for different functions and then add in different arrows for different relationships. And these can get quite complex. You can have multiple inputs leading to a single output. And this is one way to model that internal model, that internal state. Um, so this actually allows us to model additive and multiplicative effects of polygenic and multi-sensory input. So things from the genome, things from the, uh, you know, from sort of an innate source of information, and then a, a top-down uh, regulation of multi-sensory inputs from the environment. And so all these things can be merged into an internal model, and those internal models can be quite complex. So how do you measure a continuous internal state? We mentioned that in the paper. We give a couple of examples, but I wanted to show these things visually. So one way we can measure continuous internal states is by using real-time measurements of brain activity. So we can use EEG, which is an electrical signal, or we can use FNIR, which is a hemodynamic signal. And that gives us information about what's going on during continuous behavior in the brain or in the internal model. Um, we can also use eye tracking in naturalistic settings. So in this case, they're doing eye tracking during driving, when you're driving in a complex environment. And this gives information about what the eyes are doing and what's controlling the eyes during this process. So we have these opportunities for perturbation. We can measure uh, physiologically you know, the response to this, we can model the internal state based on what we think is going on. So the, but the thing is, is that the internal state can be quite complex as we've seen and involve multiple variables. So if we go and we use the simple time series that we, show, we showed before, that's really a toy representation. So we, what kinds of actual approximations of internal states can we use? I mean, we need to do something more than just this simple time series. Those are much more complex. And again, we can turn to dynamical systems to help us out here. We can use things like quadratic surfaces and fitness landscapes, which I've shown examples of here, which are multidimensional representations of the same type of uh, single time series with perturbations. You can imagine these peaks and valleys as being um, places where perturbations are delivered and perturbations are responded to. And there's, you know, a uh, typical system is taking a path across this rugged landscape, and we can measure all of that, but it's much more complex and multidimensional. We can also use, uh, we can look at transient states and transitional processes using this type of approach as well. And this is a, an approach to transient phenomena and ecology. So they're using this uh, landscape model to model, um, you know, species during 
uh, changes in the uh, eco changes in ecosystems over time. So they're again they're they're looking at noise or stochasticity. They're looking at multiple time scales and uh, some of the patterns that occur at multiple time scales and high dimensionality. And they're able to model transient states. So all those things are I think necessary for future development or for application of really complex systems that you might want to characterize. Finally, I'm going to talk about applications to neuro HCI. So the first one is this driving as continuous cognition idea. I talked about it a couple of slides back. And so this is where you have someone who's driving a vehicle in a very high precision environment. So there's a lot of per potential perturbations here. Uh, you have potential disruptions of attention and awareness, which are critical to this task in multiple timescales. As you can see, if, some, if you hit something on the roadway or there's a car that swerves in front of you, uh, or if there's a curve coming up, all those things can be potential disruptions. And so, but they happen at multiple time scales. Uh, some of these allow for easy recovery, like preparing for a turn, but others are hard to recover from. If there's a car that swerves in front of you, I think you're gonna see that in the GIF. Uh, you know, if you're passing a car, all those things can be maybe somewhat hard to recover from. So they lead to different outcomes, like a crash or uh, adjusting your strategy, your position, these sorts of things. Um, but interesting, and, and we talk about this a little bit in the paper, um, when you gain expertise in maybe using a tool, you extend your body schema. And it, your body schema is a representation of your body in the sort of the uh, near body space. And when you use a tool like a, a steering wheel, that steering wheel becomes almost like part of your bodily representation. So it in, it'll eventually over time as a professional race car driver, your bodily representation will include the steering wheel. And so that has an effect on this homeostatic regulation of steering control. So now your internal model is controlling steering, but it's not doing it in a way that's sort of, uh, you know, abstract and objective. It's, it's sort of incorporated into your body schema. So it's as if you were like running down the track and trying to avoid obstacles here by, you know, doing something like running or reaching out. And so there's a interesting effect there on performance. Um, we also have this other example of interacting with virtual objects in augmented reality and virtual reality. And so here you have someone with uh, virtual reality goggles and they're moving this augmented uh, object with a wand. There's no contact with the virtual object. There's no haptic feedback necessarily, but they're moving it around in the environment. And so you can have, again, potential disruptions of attention aware and awareness in multiple sensory modalities this time. So you can have like a disruption to your arm. Your arm might hit something inadvertently, or you might not be able to see certain parts of the object. You might get distracted by something off in the distance, some noise. And so all those can, uh, you know, affect your performance on this task. Um, but because there are no, uh, there isn't proper sensory feedback. You, for example, you can't feel the globe moving it. You know, you're moving it with a wand that's decoupled from the globe and there's no haptic feedback and you're just kind of moving your arm. That kind of, you know, even if you really, you know, if you're if the wand is part of your body representation, it still isn't touching the globe. So it's a passive sort of interaction. Um, this can introduce a perturbation um, you know, or introduce a perturbation just by lack of sensory integration that would normally occur with real objects versus virtual objects. Uh, you can also experience allostatic drive or that change in state over time due to allostatic load uh, due to object tracking. So when you say, for example, if the tracking of this object breaks down, you hear a noise and you turn your head and you lose focus on the object because it looks like you have to turn your head and watch it move in a certain direction, this can be a problem and this can lead to this uh, this sort of allostatic uh, drive that we talked about before. Uh, you can also have information overload. You might have to track like five or 10 globes at once and you might have to move them around in quick succession. And so that's information overload or irregular behaviors. Like, you know, you have to move the globe in a circle to the right and a circle to the left clockwise, counterclockwise, and people can get confused and that can change the internal state as well. 
Um, finally, this sensory substitution example, um, this is what happens when you have, you know, you basically put a blindfold over someone and then you tell them to interact with the environment as they normally would, but you've taken away their vision. And then you're using this uh, sensor as a replacement, which is a sensor that generates a noise, I guess. And so you have to use that in, to replace your visual sense. And so this is, of course, a highly uh, difficult uh, environment to perform in. So you, you'll see performance adjustments when you substitute one sense for another. This introduces a lot of perturbations at various mag of various magnitudes that you wouldn't have with visual confirmation. We talked about the cutaneous rabbit a couple slides ago. You would have similar things going on here. Uh, you have noisy communication in this alternate sensory channel just by virtue of not really being used to it, but also because it can't model everything your visual system models. Um, it also enhances the response to perturbations. So a perturbation that you might get from visual confirmation, you know, you might have a distraction that you experience and you can kind of uh, recover from it. Uh, with this kind of system, you might experience a similar perturbation and not be able to recover from it because you don't know how to adjust your, um, your internal model doesn't know how to adjust. Finally, allostatic load occurs during rerouting to other senses. So as you're using this new sense and substitution for your site, there, there's a rerouting that goes on to your other senses. Maybe your other senses are enhanced, but that also means that there's a change in the internal state and an increase in allostatic load. And so uh, the internal model can recover or exhibit homeostasis or can trigger allostatic drive. It just depends on how your other senses deal with the loss of the, the original sense. And so finally, uh, I wanted to mention this. I wanted to give, like, talk about how to purposefully induce environmental perturbations. So we had examples, case studies, where you can observe these effects. Uh, but how do you purposefully induce environmental perturbations? And that's through selective mismatch. And we can use virtual and real environments to demonstrate this. In a real environment, we can look at someone using a fly swatter on a fly. The fly lands on a surface and someone swats at the fly and the fly flies away before you can swat it. And this is a common problem. And the reason is, is because the fly has much higher visual acuity than the individual trying to swat it. And so there's a alias, sort of an alias perception of, you know, you're like the fly is much faster than you. So there's this aliasing effect relative to your sensory. Um, system. And so the perception of this, it's an environmental perturbation. You have this fly, it's too fast for your senses. You have to sort of find a strategy, find a stable state for getting the fly on the first swat. And that's not easy because you don't have the proper sort of sampling rate to do that. Um, so you can introduce, you know, you can introduce that task and you can introduce a environmental perturbation like that on purpose. Another example comes from a virtual world. And this is a roller coaster simulation. And the question is, how many sensory inputs does the simulation need? If I want to put someone in this roller coaster, uh, you know, I can like model this roller coaster any way I want. I can be as realistic as possible in terms of modeling the sensory inputs, or I can purposefully leave out sensory inputs. I can just give you visual information like this, or I can put you in a, in a cart with haptic feedback and lateral you know, movement and all these different things that will introduce the proper sensory inputs that you would get riding a real roller coaster. And we've, you know, we think about this in terms of uh, telepresence uh, and sensory presence, but what is the, you know, what is, we can introduce environmental perturbations using this type of model and we can understand them a little bit better, especially in a naturalistic manner. So thank you for your attention. This is again, our model of perturbations and recoveries. Uh, we're, our lab is on YouTube. We have a GitHub repo that you might wanna check out. We have a LinkedIn profile. We have a Twitter feed that's quite active and we have a website on weebly.com. And finally, I wanna just put a plug in for our work on continual embodied learning. So our work on this allostasis machines approach is part of a larger uh, objective. And so 
This is this says here, keep experiencing perturbations until your descendants evolve. And so we like to think of uh, perception and, and what's going on in the brain is this long-term continuum from single trial learning to long-term memory to the lifespan and then uh, you know, evolving uh, multiple generations of agents to get to evolution and historical memory. And so we have some uh, Bradenburg vehicles here that are experiencing perturbations in their uh, near-term behavior, but over the long term, we might be able to evolve um, interesting outcomes from that um, type of uh, perceptual selection. And so we're doing this work on a continuum body learning, which is another topic for another day, but I thought I'd bring that up as well. Maybe that's food for thought. In any case, thank you for listening to me and uh, enjoy the workshop.